So basically, um, there's something called the American Epilepsy Society. Um, I don't know, I looked at that and I'd never heard of them and I thought maybe they made up that name, but nonetheless, they uh, came up with a consensus statement in dealing with patients with status epilepticus. Uh, so the idea is that a lot of this is stuff we were doing, but they're talking about a more organized fashion with this, and there are different steps along the way that we will be involved, either as first, um, sort of the first responders, or else as transferring uh, patients. So what they've decided to do, they came up with four different phases of where a patient's therapy should be. Uh, the first is the stabilization phase, so that's standard first aid, ABCs, position their head, yada, yada. Um, initial therapy phase, which sounds like that should be the first phase, but it's actually the second phase, but it's the initial therapy phase. And that's where they talk about benzos. That's where usually we're going to fit in with, as first responders, we're giving benzos to these patients um, in whatever route available. Uh, the second line of therapy, which is the third phase, is where they will give a lot of the classic sort of anticonvulsants, things like dilantin or phosphenitoin, which is the new dilantin, um, valproic acid, Keppra is being used much uh, more so now, supposedly the side effect profile and the interactive profile with other medications is less, so you'll, you'll be seeing a lot more patients being given that. And then they have the third line of therapy, also known as the fourth phase, where we're talking about giving a lot of general anesthesia drugs. You'll see Versed's there, midazolam, but they're talking about giving it as drips or in general anesthesia type dosing. So the stabilization phase, supportive care, ABCs, this is all gonna be pre-hospital and in many situations before we're even called um, with these patients. The part that we get involved in is the second phase, uh, which is administering the drugs uh, after four to five minutes of seizure. Um, Valium, Versed, those all can be administered as, uh, as we know it. Um, one of the things that's important, and we get sort of used to taking our patients with seizure disorder and like, yeah, they just had another seizure, and yeah, it's probably they didn't take their meds again, and that's the overwhelming majority of them. But it is helpful to know whether it's a situation that it was a non-compliance from the best people could tell. Was there a change in medications? What was the situation predisposing? Was there a trauma before this? Has there been illness? Um, has there been drug, a recreational drug use? Is there something else that maybe uh, is playing a role in this? So the third phase, or the second line of therapy, uh, they talk about a little bit more aggressive support. Uh, it's interesting that they're saying D50 and thiamine in all these patients. Um, certainly part of that is part of our, our altered mental status protocols. Um, and I find it interesting that they say thiamine um, because they actually studied thiamine levels in a lot of the drugs that came in. We were talking about, you know, Wernicke's uh, encephalopathy that's related to thiamine deficiency uh, with patients and can cause altered mental status, seizure, typically in your malnourished drugs. Someone ended up measuring, uh, it was probably some residence project who thought, man, we keep giving them like bag lunches and turkey sandwiches. How could these people be low with thiamine? And as it turns out, the majority are not. So in this day and age where there's a turkey sandwich for every drunk, they're not gonna be low with the thiamine. Uh, so that part, at least in Western New York, we probably don't need to rush to the thiamine. Uh, however, they talk about the benzos being given, um, and if it continues, then you go to the dilantin, uh, which I put the mix per minute. What's happened is, is that not only are we stuck experiencing the shortages, so are hospitals. They really are in, in many ways that are not good for patients. But one of the things is, is that phosphenitoin was, was something we could just push, um, is something that we don't have available as much. So now we have to go back to Dilantin. Um, how many of you have been practicing EMS for close to 20 years? Okay. Do you remember that lidocaine, yeah, that drug uh, that maybe might be making a little bit of a sort of quasi comeback? Does anybody remember anything about it being a type 1A antiarrhythmic? Do you remember anything about that? So basically that means that it, it actually can prolong QT, anything that's in that class. As it turns out, 
Dilantin is a type 1A antiarrhythmic. So it can prolong QT, um, which is part of the reason that you need to administer it slowly. So if someone has that running, it's conceivable you could end up being transported in a patient who has that because the most you can have go in is 50 mg per minute. And typically we talk about um, a pretty respectable uh, load. And then if you're talking about the Buffalo unit, um, does anybody know about the Buffalo unit? Uh, it's something they talk about in trauma at ECMC. Um, so a buffalo unit is 100 pounds. So most of the patients are multiple buffalo units. Uh, so they don't necessarily need the classic dosing of Dilantin. They might need it a little higher. Uh, but one of the things that's interesting that they suggest with this is that actually if the first bolus doesn't work is that you give a second bolus of it. Um, so the toxicity with Dilantin is mostly that you start looking drunk and you're really dizzy and they have like really bad nystagmus when they're awake. So most of these are bothersome symptoms when you are awake and not post-ictal or in status epilepticus. So they say it doesn't matter if they have mild toxicity, give them a second dose. Apparently a lot of these patients respond. So this is something actually that'll probably change a lot of our um, practices if we're giving Dilantin. Uh, in many situations, we're giving Keppra because it's available until the next drug shortage. Uh, and then we'll be giving Dilantin. Uh, third line of therapy. So it's quite conceivable that in the situation where you're transferring a patient, they might be on one of these agents. Uh, so there are things that we need to know about them. Uh, Bursed uh, might be something that's given as a drip. Um, the drip could be interrupted in which situation if that person starts breaking, uh, seizing when they're on that, that's easy. We just give what we have usually for a benzo. Um, Pentobarb is something else too that can be given. Propofol, um, so propofol is interesting. Propofol has become one of the things, especially in pediatrics, that we're giving a lot more for kids in status who were having a hard time breaking. Um, does anybody remember what propofol does? It killed Michael Jackson, that's right. <laughs> um, it's actually an induction agent for general anesthesia, but uh, one of the things that we use it a lot for is procedural sedation. Anybody know about how long it lasts when you give an appropriate dose? Yeah, like a minute or two. Um, for some people, sometimes they have other stuff on board, they might stay sleepy or longer, but it doesn't last very long. So the problem is, is if something happens to interrupt that drip, that person might start seizing on you. Uh, and that's within a few minutes. Um, but one of the things with propofol, so actually buffalo, this is another thing that puts buffalo on the map. Uh, there's one of the kids who was a chronic seizure kid uh, in western New York um, that she would come in all the time. And her mom became a big reason why uh, medical marijuana is now legalized, whether that's a pro or con. She was an important person in the, in the, uh, in the availability of it right now. But her daughter, um, among um, other problems, she was on about four or five different seizure meds. And she'd come in in status, and we'd have to intubate and paralyze her, and then put her on you know, pentobarb coma, and you know, just waiting for the seizures to sort of break. And every once in a while, getting off of that, seeing on the EEG if she was still seizing, and you know, getting her back on it. So um, they were getting ready to intubate her once, and they gave her some propofol and she stopped seizing. Wow. So that ended up getting written up. As it turned out, there were a few other places in North America that had also experienced a similar thing. So there was a cadre of maybe a half dozen that were, had writ this, written this up, and we were among the first ones um, that stated this. And so now it's, it's considered um, a standard of care as a third, uh, third therapeutic line. Um, so you might have patients who are on propofol. Ketamine infusions, um, they've also been used with some success. Uh, as far as why it works, it's sort of interesting. Ketamine is actually just a dissociative agent, so it, it separates the cortex of the brain, which is where a lot of um, seizure activity originates from the rest of the body. So whether it's truly stopping the seizure or decreasing the rest of the brain's irritability to it, not certain, but it does seem to decrease activity. 
So some of the side effects of these drugs, important to know because these are the patients that we're, we're transferring and transporting. Uh, pentobarb, uh, if they're not intubated, they can get apneic, um, especially if they got benzos first. Uh, Versed, apnea. Versed is one of those things that hypotension can happen, and a lot of that is because of the stuff that the Versed needs in order to dilute it into solution there. So that can cause hypotension that can be cumulative over time. Propofol, it's really short acting, so they can start seizing if it's interrupted. And ketamine um, can cause bronchorrhea. Um, that's one of those things, yeah, the patient will start blowing bubbles. That's uh, when I'm doing sedations on the babies, lots of times uh, you know that the ketamine is working. Part one, because their eyes are doing that, but they start blowing bubbles. It's awesome. Um, and they can also get a dissociative reaction uh, if it's uh, interrupted. Not as much with the kids as much as with um, maybe teenagers and adults. So that's uh, the drugs that we have there. Any questions about status epilepticus? OK, every, yes? Just uh, similar, Thursday I did a transfer down to Buffalo General. Uh-huh. It was a subarachnoid on but they gave him uh, Kepra. Kepra. He didn't seize it all, but they just gave that. Yeah, Kepra. so that's another thing, too. The neurosurgeons are not as excited in many situations unless there's significant edema about them getting an anticonvulsant. They've actually backed quite a bit off of that. But if there's edema or impending herniation, there's a little more risk with that patient to seize. So they're going to be giving them, and like I said, Kepra, you're going to see more and more because of its less, lesser side effect profile. It's more expensive, it's not necessarily as available.